Dr. Ted Naiman is a board certified family medicine physician in the Department of Primary Care at a leading medical center in Seattle. His personal research and medical practice are focused on the practical implementation of diet and exercise for health optimization. He is the author of The PE Diet. In the book, Dr. Naiman explains the protein to energy ratio and how to use it to optimize food and exercise choices. And with that, let me start the interview. So hello, Dr. Naiman. You are a primary care physician in Seattle and also the author of the PE Diet book. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to Modern Health Span. Wow, thank you for having me. Great to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. So Dr. Naiman, can you give a quick introduction of yourself and what led you to your kind of interest in diet? Oh, sure. Absolutely. So I'm a primary care doctor here in Seattle, and I've been practicing for about uh, 22 years. I believe I got out of residency 22 years ago. And uh, I've always had an interest in diet, possibly because um, I was raised uh, vegetarian and I trained at Loma Linda University. Um, and I, probably your listeners are familiar with Loma Linda, which is famous as one of these blue zones where everyone lives a long time. So I trained at Loma Linda. I was vegetarian for decades. Um, I had an interest in, you know, diet and health at that point. And then um, when I entered practice, I, I saw patients, you know, radically transforming their health with various types of diets, low carb and strategies like that. And I just became very interested in the vast differences between the patients I saw who were in amazing health, amazing body composition, amazing metabolic health, and then patients who were in horrible health, you know, and diabetes and everything's wrong and just falling apart. And I, I've been extremely interested in what sorts of environmental things drive people in one of these two directions, you know, and so I've been researching diet and exercise and health uh, for the past, you know, 22 years, my whole career. And Basically, I found that it really is fairly simple. You can break down all the things that explain the phenotypic differences between really healthy people and really unhealthy people with just some pretty simple diet and exercise uh, concepts. And that's what inspired me to write this book. And that's the sort of thing I've been interested in. It's the very practical, biggest levers to driving health or disease with diet and exercise. Right. Can you talk a little bit about your personal journey to the PE diet? Because you started off as vegetarian, you said, but how did you get to like the PE diet? Right. Uh, well, I, you know, I've been so uh, in the past, I really didn't know very much about how diet worked or what sort of uh, elements of diet really driving health. And so because I didn't have a lot of actual knowledge, um, I had sort of almost like religious beliefs. You know, I feel like when, when humans don't know a lot about how something works, we just kind of have a fantastical or religious kind of uh, flavor to the things we believe about it. So at first I thought, you know, vegetarian was just religiously beneficial somehow, like we're not supposed to eat animals or kill anything. You know what I mean? It almost had a religious overtime to it. And then I um, was introduced to low carb by some, by a patient and I realized, realized, oh, wow, this is very, very powerful. And then I realized, yeah, um, you know, refined carbs are a huge driver of obesity and diabetes and a lot of our problems. So, you know, if refined carbs are bad, then all carbs are bad. And if carbs are bad, fat is good. And then more fat is better and less carbs are better. And I ended up doing the whole, you know, very low carb keto um, somewhere in there. I had a religious, uh, um, interest in paleo. I was like, Oh, if you're just, you know, if you just only eat what cavemen ate, you know, that has to be the ideal diet somehow. So, you know, I was religiously paleo. I was religiously low carb. I was religiously keto and I've done carnivore and every sort of crazy diet religion that you could name, right? Just like everybody else. I was just like glomming onto these religious things. And then I realized, oh, wait a second, you know, I see people who are having really big health benefits with any one of these particular patterns. I might see somebody going on a low fat um, vegan or vegetarian diet and radically improving body composition and health, or somebody might go carnivore and have the same thing, or somebody might go, you know, plants, animals, fat, carbs, like it almost didn't seem to matter. You would have some sort of improvement with any of these. And, and I thought, okay, hold on. <laughs> 
something's something's going on here, right? Like how, you know, if if carbs are the only problem, how come these low fat vegans are doing so well? Or if uh, animals are the problem, uh, how come these carnivores are looking so good? Yeah. So I, and, I, and then I finally realized that there's these big overarching themes to diet in general that literally explain er the success from every single particular dietary um, strategy. And that's how I came up with this, you know, PE diet framework. And basically that's how I explain all the black swans out there that you have. If you think the answer is just low carb or just low fat or just plants, you're just animals or all these other false dichotomies that kind of aren't as important as people in those camps think they are. So now I have this sort of agnostic 50,000 foot view of diet uh, where I realized, oh, plants versus animals is kind of a false dichotomy and carbs versus fat is a false dichotomy. And it's actually bigger than that. And you, these are all individual levers you can pull inside of this bigger framework. And that's kind of how I arrived at, you know, where I'm at today. Right. So I think that's a, a kind of a good point to kind of turn to the PE diet, which is what you developed. So can you explain the philosophy behind the PE diet? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So if you zoom way, 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 way out and think about, well, what is eating in general, right? So plants end up making all the food for all animals. Basically plants make their own food and then animals just eat plants. So all of your animals are either eating other animals who ate plants or plants themselves or both. So basically plants make all the food animals eat all the plants or other animals eat plants. And what plants are doing is two very, very specific things. First of all, they're performing photosynthesis where they take uh, carbon dioxide and sunlight and make carbon chains, chains of carbons with high energy bonds. And those can either be hydrocarbons, which are fats or carbohydrates, which are carbs, but they're all just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen chained together with high energy bonds. And your body can burn either carbs or fats indiscriminately, we're a hybrid engine, we can switch back and forth very easily. So you have societies where people eat, you know, tons of carbs, hardly any fat, or tons of fat, hardly any carbs, really uh, can have the same outcome either way. So you're basically your plants are just making carbon based energy as carbs or fats, but plants are doing something else that's completely different and separate and special. And that is they're sucking minerals up from the soil, most notably nitrogen and a couple other dozen minerals that are essential to life on earth. And they're using nitrogen to form proteins and proteins are the basis of the structure of your whole body. All of your tissues are made up of proteins, all of your enzymes and your hormones and all of your function and structure of your body is made up of proteins, which are amino acids, which require nitrogen, which is different from the carbon chain energies that plants are making from photosynthesis into carbs and fats. So you've got the three macros, right? And carbs and fats can be sort of lumped together as just carbon-based energy, carbon, you know, high energy carbon bonds. Uh, but protein is different. It's nitrogen and has a few other minerals as well, sometimes sulfur, et cetera, that's absorbed from soil. So you kind of have a protein, which is uh, your body rarely uses for energy, it prefers to use protein, you know, structurally or for function uh, versus these energy, these pure energies, carbs or fats that your body stores in your fat cells or in your uh, muscle or liver glycogen. And what we have basically now is this massive epidemic of, you know, over fatness and metabolic syndrome and energy toxicity and diabetes um, from getting too much non-protein energy. Um, in the course of achieving protein adequacy. And then, and then we get into protein leverage and it turns out that um, humans have a, a very strong protein leverage factor and protein dilution. And it, when you look at it from this protein energy uh, lens, you can kind of explain the entire diabetes epidemic and all sorts of stuff. Okay, so you used a couple of words in there like protein leverage. Can you explain what you mean by that? <clears throat> Absolutely. Right. So it turns out that most animals are combining foods to get the amount of protein they need and the amount of non-protein energy they need. So if like you lock the animal up in a cage and they've got just a protein source like chi uh, skinless chicken breast, and then they have just an energy source like car you know, sugar or oil, they're going to eat a little bit of one and a little bit of the other and combine the two to get just the proportion of protein they need and non-protein energy they need. And it turns out that 
humans and most animals have a very powerful protein leverage phenomenon where you're basically going to eat until you get enough protein and only then are you going to stop eating. So we prioritize protein really, really strongly. And if you look at, you know, the entire globe, there's this huge difference in carbs and fats eaten. We have countries, you know, Japan, they eat hardly any fat, tons of carbs, uh, or, you know, uh, Germany or Norway or these countries where they eat tons of fat and way less carbs. And, uh, but protein is just extremely laser focused at, you know, 14, 15% of calories in every country on earth. And the reason this happens is because of this super powerful protein leverage. It's a very, very powerful phenomenon. And it turns out that if you eat foods that have a higher protein percentage, you automatically just eat fewer calories. And if you have, eat foods that have a lower protein percentage, you automatically have to eat more calories to get the same amount of protein. So if you look at the entire, like if you look at the past 60 years of the global obesity epidemic, um, the amount, the grams of protein that we ate before and after are exactly the same. Like there's maybe 20 gram difference just because everyone has larger bodies now and we have a slightly higher absolute protein requirement. But the amount of protein we've eaten has not changed at all. Carbs and fats, however, have both gone up like two or 300 calories per day from equally from carbs and fats. So everyone's eating, you know, 250 more uh, calories from carbs and another 250 more from fat every day on average now than we were prior to the obesity epidemic. So the, in every single extra calorie of the obesity epidemic have come exclusively from carbs and fats. And the way it's worked is protein dilution. So we took all of our foods and we figured out how to strip out pure carbs and fats in the form of sugar and flour and oil. And we've dumped these into the food supply. So the protein percent's a lot lower. So like, for example, hunter gatherers eat um, a very high protein percentage. It's about 30% protein uh, by uh, calories. And, and if you average out all the hunter gatherer groups on earth, it's they're averaging about 30% protein. But um, over the past uh, 60 years of the obesity epidemic in America, we went from about 15% protein to about 12 and percent protein from protein dilution. And now everybody's eating these very low protein foods where you literally have to overeat carbs and fats just to get the same amount of protein. And that's driving the obesity epidemic hugely. And, and that's basically how protein leverage works. And it's a very, very powerful thing from 10% protein, uh, by calories to 30% protein by calories, you've got about a 10 to one gear ratio for, where for every single calorie of protein you eat um, higher, you're going to automatically eat 10 calories fewer of carbs and fats. So it's very, very strong, very dramatic. You can really um, uh, force an animal or a human to eat more or less calories by altering the protein percentage of their diet. And this is something that most people are blissfully unaware of. Like nobody really knows that this is happening. Nobody knows this is how, you know, food works. And uh, it's really only recently that, that this protein leverage phenomenon was figured out by uh, doctors Robin Heimer and Simpson in Australia. These two uh, researchers who've been looking at this phenomenon in all sorts of species on earth from birds to fish to all sorts of mammals and humans, of course. So uh, yeah, that's what protein leverage is. It, it's not in everybody's vocabulary, but it really probably should be.